So a while back I wrote a video essay about the movie Office Space, and during my research I found myself deep inside a fascinating rabbit hole concerning one event in particular. It all started on the film's Wikipedia page. The section about marketing contained an excerpt that I would read over and over as I wrote my script for my video essay. The studio also had a man live in a plexiglass cube above Times Square for five days. Livingston, when he visited the cube for press events, found that most reporters preferred to talk to the man in the cube and not him. Now if you're like me, you're wondering why the hell they did that. In my video I touched on how ineffective the marketing was for this film, but the imagery of a man placed in a glass box overlooking Times Square sounded so striking and weird to me. I had to see what this plexiglass cube looked like. Office Space gained its cult audience a few years after its release, meaning almost every single fan of the film likely never even knew this publicity stunt occurred in the first place. After days of searching for pictures, I found nothing but a saddening revelation. Not a single photo of this plexiglass cube exists on the entire internet. Until now. This is the forgotten story of OfficeGuy.com. Upon googling office space marketing stunt, like I said, pictures of this thing are nowhere to be found. I did see an article from June 2020 on the British website Film Stories titled The Troubled Attempts to Promote 1999's Office Space. Apparently, the company in charge of marketing the film needed an office guy, a personality for the public to become attached to so they would go see a movie about a different guy? Anyway. They built this room made of plexiglass walls, put it on a building in Times Square, and made it look like an office cubicle. Underneath the cubicle was a billboard with a phone number on it. 1877 work sucks. People were invited to call that number so they could complain about their jobs. The person they hired to be office guy was paid to sit in this plexiglass cubicle to take these calls and listen to them. Contrary to what Livingston said about it, nobody lived in there. So who did they hire? What I found very surprising is that this article gave a name as well, Andrew Berlinson, who you probably know as the guitarist in the fictional band Mouse Rat from the show Parks and Recreation. As if this webpage couldn't get any more helpful, it also linked to an article straight from the Harvard Crimson posted February 18, 1999. Aspiring actor Andrew Berlinson, class of 97, is enjoying his first 15 minutes of fame as the promotional personality for the new movie Office Space. This is what stuck out to me. He remains encased from 9 to 5 every weekday on live feed at www.officeguy.com. They live streamed this whole thing, every second of it, in 1999. Obviously, officeguy.com doesn't exist anymore, so I needed to use the Wayback Machine to access the original website. And it is from 1999. The earliest snapshot of the website comes from April 22nd, 1999, a few months after the live stream ended, so we're already a little late. What that means is that this website contains the only picture known to exist of this cube, and there's a big ass post-it note over it. It's quite apparent that after the movie came out, they updated the website to show their live stream ended, and then it was quickly forgotten about. If they chose to put this post-it note anywhere else on the page, leaving this single photo uncovered, I probably would have ended my search here but this was not gonna suffice. This link here brings us to the journal entries Andrew wrote after every day he was up there, cataloging some of the more interesting calls he's received. From a pregnant pediatrician whose vacation was canceled because two of her coworkers were sick at the same time, to a receptionist at a car dealership made to flash her legs on the side of the road to attract customers, to a guy who got a bruise on his hand from stapling a lot. At this point, I had more than enough information to track Andrew down, so I went to his Twitter, sent him a DM explaining my search, and hoped for the best. Exactly a day later, he responds. Hi Sean, thanks for reaching out. How did you know I did that? I go on to explain the startling lack of photographic evidence of this online and kindly ask if he has any photos he can send my way. Six minutes later, sure man, I think I have a photo somewhere for you. He sees fills my underwear. I am about to become one of the only people to see a photograph of this plexiglass cube in over 20 years, and it's from the man himself. I wait a few days. Hey Sean, I found a great little photo album that I've been hanging on to all these years. I'll try to scan them in and get them to you as soon as I can. The next day, I give him my email. He sends me a link. And they're beautiful. My hands are shaking as I click through each photo for the first time in disbelief that I was in possession of this long forgotten lost media, and all I had to do was ask for it. Sitting here looking at these photos now, I'm moved by how an event like this can not only be forgotten, but also totally erased off the face of the planet. Now the photos can live on. You're, you're the office guy. I was the office guy, yeah, that's right. We set up an interview so I could learn all about what happened during those two weeks and to get some backstory on these one-of-a-kind photographs. So I was totally unemployed and I had never had a professional acting gig at that point. I had a cousin who had started 
this brand new thing called the online marketing division at Fox. The web was brand new, basically, or relatively new. So they built this very rudimentary website for most movies and then didn't really do much with it. She called me one day and said that this fun, subversive movie is coming out by the dude who made Beavis and Butthead, and they have no budget, really, to promote it. So they're coming up with this relatively cheap publicity stunt to put a young office worker up in a glass encased cubicle in Times Square with a billboard and an 800 number and a web camera pointed at him all day. And that was going to be it. That was going to be the publicity for the movie. This kind of baffled me. The entire marketing budget was riding on the success of this two week long localized and live stream based publicity stunt at a time when the internet itself was still in its infancy. Not many companies were utilizing the internet like this back then, which makes the live stream aspect kind of a groundbreaking way to market a film. Even though it didn't work at all and the film's financial outcome was an embarrassing disaster, it's still a bold move. But that doesn't excuse the fact that Jennifer Aniston was in the movie. And the poster looks like this. Jennifer Aniston at the time was one of the biggest stars on television. It seems like that's a no-brainer just to put her face on everything. Apparently the studio didn't want her on the poster because her role was too small. Oh, come on. Um, <laughs> so dumb. Mike Judge hated the poster. Was it the sticky note guy? Yeah, yeah. One of the pictures I sent you, there's a dude that's waving at the camera. That actor was hired to be the sticky note guy. They built a foam suit that looked like a, a, a million sticky notes. I kept in contact with Andrew as I wrote the script for the video you're watching, and we eventually found out who this man is. Justin Campbell is his name. We deduced that he probably wasn't the man photographed for the movie poster. If anyone thinks they can find this guy, please let me know in the comments because I can't find him anywhere. This guy was the one who wore the suit during live publicity, really? but you probably know him from this commercial. Like who are you talking to? Uh, it's Jake from State Farm. Sounds like a really good deal. Here's a little tidbit, which is kind of cool. At the time, my roommate, very good buddy of mine, was Mike Shore, who is the co-creator of Parks and Recreation. We made this like home movie, basically like The Office. So anyway, I submitted this audition tape that looked kind of like The Office, and they gave me the gig. Keep in mind that they probably filmed this sketch in late 1998, years before The Office UK came out in 2001. Mike Sure would eventually work in The Office for years, producing 71 episodes and writing 10 of them. This original audition tape is properly lost now. It was filmed on VHS and they sent in the only copy, but Andrew said it had the exact same format. We got a little camcorder and he recorded me in our apartment, just pretending to be like a total lazy worker. And that would be a really good thing to find is that like video that Mike and I made together. It would be crazy to find this tape now. Something so similar to a show as big as The Office made by a main producer years before it released that's an incredible piece of lost media. Picture number one is the cubicle. That's it. I'm doing a live television interview right there. It was February, and so it was pretty cold in New York City, but on sunny days, it got really hot. Picture number two, the exterior cam. Those cameras were live the whole time, and no one had really done that kind of thing before, of just, hey, let's just watch this person be. <laughs> you know, let's just watch this person exist. Picture three is just basically the cubicle. And unfortunately, if you like zoom in on some of those notes, they're like really off color jokes that would not fly today. <laughs> <laughs> Number four was my view up Broadway or down Broadway. I don't know which way I'm facing. The building was abandoned. I don't think it's there anymore. I'm pretty sure it was right at 42nd Street as far as I know. In the months following this interview, this question would haunt Andrew, who would do some research of his own and get back to me about his theories on the cubicle's exact location. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out where the hell I was. The billboard that we're looking at for these two ladies was back on the back of the building right here, which means I would have been on top of this building, but this building did not exist. He's right. That's Times Square Tower at 1459 Broadway, which started construction in 2001 during the redevelopment effort of 42nd Street in the late 90s. The building Andrew was in must have been recently retired before it was demolished. He also sent me a photo I hadn't seen before that made the existence of more photographs feel more tangible than ever. A link sent me to Mark Williamson's website, a photographer who has been traveling the world since 1985. Coincidentally, he found himself in New York City in February of 1999 taking this photo. As of right now, this is the only photo we have of the billboard installed directly beneath the cubicle. I contacted Mark to see if he had any more like this, fingers crossed with a cubicle in the frame, but he responded saying he had never heard of office space. He just wanted a picture of the airplane statue. He was gracious enough to send me a full resolution scan of the original slide without me even asking. Thank you, Mark.
And there's Ron. He was a really nice dude. He worked out like a bit where he bought some donuts. He's like, I have some donuts here for you. And then they're like, oh, star of the film, Ron Livingston. They had these random people come up and do things like that's acupuncture. They set up a Playboy playmate named Ulrika Erickson, I think is her name. I'm actually on the phone with my mother. Uh, tell your mother, he's a very nice boy. <laughs> <laughs> they sent up like Coco Pazzo Teatro. Again, I think one of the weirder novelties of this whole promotion was was the aspect of live webcam publicity. They had a sushi chef come up and make sushi with me and I would hang up the sign to tell people around the web what was going on because the cameras didn't have any sound. Morning dudes, like local radio guys came up. And I also had a bunch of telephone interviews with radio outlet outlets all over the country. I was allowed to have friends come up and visit me from time to time. The guy right next to me was another one of my roommates at the time who is CNN anchor John Berman. It was a pretty active gig. People were calling constantly. Not just like you, ha you had to be an improviser but you also had to be a little bit of a writer. I don't know how detailed I got in the journal, but some of the people that called in really emptied their guts. And I felt like a therapist at a certain point. There are two conversations that stick out in my mind. One was a New York City bus driver. And he's like, I just, you know, I got a call because work really sucks, you know, and I want to talk about it. And he sounded really depressed, you know. I was sitting there like, I am, I'm not qualified to have this conversation. So I'm going to listen to this guy. Hopefully I can make him laugh a little bit lighten the load somewhat. And another a woman called in that she was basically being sexually harassed at work. And it was pretty deep, pretty dark, but it was cathartic, I think, for a lot of people to call in. And that's probably why the movie is so popular is because like you said, it's really timeless and work is work and people always have to work and they want to commiserate about it. I think about the people who organized Office Guy and how much they clearly cared about the idea. They printed a billboard, rented a phone line, made a website, live-streamed hours a day for two weeks, arranged radio and TV interviews, and invited celebrities. All of this centered around a big box made of metal and plexiglass built and installed on a roof in the busiest place in America. The movie they attempted to promote failed hard, leaving all of that effort vain and forgotten. I hope this video changes that. If you found that interesting, you can help out by sending this video to your friends or lost media fans. Pretty much anyone who you think has a shot of uncovering something new. The links to all of these photos, my Reddit post on the Lost Media subreddit, and my original Office Space video essay from a while back will all be in the description. My name is Sean Neidhard, and thank you so much for watching.